Good evening, everybody, and, and welcome. My name is Kate Eason from the Little Phil, and I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome Margaret Bozick um, tonight. She is a former board member of the Little Phil, and she remains a very active volunteer. Um, in her working life, she was a chartered surveyor. Um, so on with tonight and the, com the comfortable home life in World War II. Thank you very mu much, Margaret. Thank you, Kay. Are you still letting people in, are you? I'm letting people in, yes. Yes, right. Well, hello, everybody. I think quite a few of you do know me. Uh, comfortable home life in the Second World War. So allow me to introduce <laughs> you to my grandmother, <laughs> Margaret Ann Parkington. Like me, she kept diaries and she was a prolific letter writer. And for this talk, I shall be describing what it was like to live on the home front during World War II using her diary entries. Now, this is the experience of a middle-aged lady who lived a comfortable life in a market town, a town that saw little enemy action and where there was sufficient food, a town that received evacuees rather than sent them away, a town where its younger people were sent away on the war effort. That town was Clitheroe. It's a market town near the Forest of Boland in Lancashire. It's got a castle, which was partly blown up by Oliver Cromwell's army. And by the 20th century, that had become a large park with a castle keep on the hill at the top. It is an agricultural centre, although big industry arrived in 1938 with the cement works, which is still extant. And in 1941, ICI opened a chemical plant in the town. Now, in my mind, it would have been similar to Hexham or Morpeth or Barnard Castle. Margaret Ann Cook was born in 1895 in Blackburn, Lancashire. When she married, her father's occupation is down as cinema caretaker. In early 1920, she began courting Wilfred Parkington, who was a widower who had returned after the war from Mesopotamia to find that his wife had died and his two young children were being cared for by his mother. And his mother said, go out and find another woman quick. They did. They got married in September 1921. She was 26 and he was 32. He brought with him Wilf, who was 10, and Hilda, who was eight. And soon afterwards, my mother Amy was born. There was no other children. So they moved to Clitheroe in 1924, where Wilf had a painting and decorating business and a shop. And it thrived. In 1939, they were able to move out of the shop and into a new house that they had commissioned and which was located at the edge of the town next to the fields. The old shop is a listed three-storey terrace building, now part of the Arts Centre. When they moved out, her stepson Wilfred moved in to the shop with his family. Now, Granny saw herself first and foremost as a housewife, but she was also a seamstress, an avid gardener. They had a huge garden and she helped out at the shop. As war broke out, she was 44, Wilf was 50, young Wilf was 27 and Amy was only 16. Hilda was 25 and she was married to Stuart, who was the same age. As a mother of a very young child, Hilda was never called up to service, but the rest were. The first act of conscription was passed by Parliament on the 26th of April 1939, 
for men aged between 20 and 22. They had to answer a compulsory call up to serve for six months full time military training, but they'd only be called up for service in an emergency. Well, war commenced in September 1939 and they found they were in it for the duration. And as soon as the war began, men aged 18 to 41 were called up unless they were medically unfit or in key industries such as baking. In September 1941, women were called up if they were unmarried or childless widows and aged between 20 and 30. And at the same time, men up to 51 were summonsed. So the first one of the family to go was uncle, my uncle Wilf, Granny's stepson. He was 28 by then. He went for the medical and expressed an interest in joining the Royal Marines, uh, but he must have got cold feet because the day after he was asking for an adjournment because he was running a decorating shop. His tribunal was held and he was allowed a six week postponement, but actually that was extended for another month. He was allocated to the RAF military police and within six months, as you can see, he was a corporal. He was posted out to West Africa and he writes to Granny, the women wear a few rags and the men nighties to walk out in and there are mud huts. He contracts malaria and he gets lost in the jungle for three days. He came back home after three and a half years of being away all the time and Granny writes in her diary, he's not altered a bit. Next to go was son-in-law Stuart. Now he was a baker, but he received his call-up papers in January 1941, only to be informed a few days later that they had been sent to the wrong person. So he signed up in September 1941 and worked as a canteen manager in Blackburn, then in Crewe, and then in Colwyn Bay. But then he was drafted into the Royal Army Service Corps, who were sent out to, with the Eighth Army to Italy and Belgium, and finally Berlin. But in August 1947, Granny writes that he has deserted in Germany and he's fathered a child by a local woman. He married her and divorced my auntie. Then he came back to Britain. And then Granny's beloved daughter, my mother Amy, volunteered to join up. She left on the 12th of February, 1943. Granny writes, a black day. Amy left at eight o'clock in the morning. We are all terribly upset. Amy became a wireless operator in the WAF. Her cousin Helen had joined up with her, but because she was short-sighted, she was sent to be a motor mechanic instead. Mum's 21st birthday was spent on a rough sea between Heesham and Northern Ireland on her way to Limavady near Londonderry. She was seasick. She was also posted in Scotland, Haverford West and Silleth. From Silleth, she writes to Granny on the 8th of December 1944. Amy sent a letter to say she'd seen five men burnt to death and she was the nearest to them and could do nothing as they were trapped. Their plane had crashed and burst into flames and blew them to bits. Three Canadians and two British. After working in a demob station in Staffordshire, she was eventually herself demobbed in July 1946. She was a pretty girl. This photo was taken in September 1944 when she was 21. On the 9th of September 1944, Granny writes, Mr. Will Bertles came up for some onions and tomatoes, and he suggested 
how would it be if your Amy and his nephew made a match of it? It would suit him fine, he said, as she is the bonniest girl in Clitheroe. But she got engaged to my father in 1945. The ring cost £26 and he was then sent off to Palestine. It, it wasn't just the young ones that were called up. Grandad was 51 in September 1941 when they called up the age group up to 52. Nothing happened about that as he was already a fire watcher, which she declared was a waste of time. She states that in July 1943, married women with families and who were aged under 50 were called up to go into war production. She was 48 and most indignant about it. I got a paper from the Labour Exchange to report next week for some sort of war work. She attends. Where there's only one person to look after, besides myself, they're expected to take a job. But I have to get a doctor's certificate to say I'm not fit for more work. Next day, she goes to see the doctor. He gave me a real medical examination and says my heart, lungs and BP are perfect, but I need toning up. So he gave me a certificate to take to the Labour Exchange, saying I wasn't fit for any extra work, only my household duties. This wasn't her first brush with authority. In November 1942, she writes, Amy and Helen went to see about enlisting. It was such a long time till our Nellie, who was my granny's sister and Helen's mother, went to see where they were. But the recruiting sergeant said they'd been and gone. So they tried to enlist our Nellie and me as cooks. But I said, nothing doing. I was a cook for 26 years and that was enough for me. Her maiden name was Cook. And she stayed as a housewife throughout the war. Two days before war was declared, a blackout was enforced throughout the whole of Britain. This procedure had been used during the First World War but then the lights were only subdued or dimmed. So the government was prepared this time. There would be no half measures because bombers needed light. Planning for it began in 1937 and to police it, civilian air raid wardens, the ARP, were trained up. And as in Dad's army, Chief Warden Hodges He's always shouting the words, put that light out. There were blackout rehearsals in 1938, which showed that traffic was the main problem. Even cars driven on side lights glittered like a string of beads from the air, revealing street patterns below. During an exercise in Ipswich, no one knew how to turn off the illuminated clock at the town hall. For the housewife, it was hard work to source blackout material and then install it as curtains and blinds, sealing any gaps with brown paper. Ordinary blackout curtains could not be washed as this was apt to make them show through light. The government therefore issued a leaflet telling people to hoover, shake, brush then iron. The latter should make them more light proof. And it was awfully inconvenient on the streets. By the end of the first month, there'd been an extra 1130 road deaths attributed to the blackout. And coroners urged pedestrians to carry a newspaper or a white handkerchief to make them visible. Many men were killed as they stepped out from the pub onto a darkened street. The blackout was compulsory from 1st of September 1939. But even in Clitheroe, they had a rehearsal in May 1939. The day allocated was foggy, 
so it was postponed. The day afterwards, the rehearsal took place. She writes, at 12 midnight till two o'clock, the siren went and wakened us all up. Then there seemed to be a lot of folk around and all pitch dark, but I went to sleep again. On the first day of the actual blackout, two days before war was declared, she writes, it's a terrible nervy day and everyone's strung up. I made some dark blue velvet curtains and I put two blue blinds up. There are no lights on in the town and it's dark, not a light showing anywhere. Everybody's after black paper and paint. And two days later, you cannot get a bit of black stuff for curtains anywhere in the town. And she gets wrong in November. I was just drawing the curtain in the shop window when PC Benson came to say he was just going to make a case of us. But her husband's acting as a warden. Theo Wilson's back premises had been left lit up, so they had to bring him in to investigate. And it wasn't just the houses that were blacked up out. All the trams in Blackburn have the windows blacked up. And everybody has got them gas masks with them. In the train, you could hardly see across the carriage. And towards the end of October, she writes, it's quite a problem for the shoppers as there's no window display at night and so few people are out. It's like living in the countryside. And the churches, chapel services are finished at night. So there's only morning and afternoon services as the chapels can't get blacked out enough. And then there were the accidents. Our Lizzie has a black eye with walking into the end of the vestibule door in the dark. Now we all know the story of the evacuees and we tend to see them from the children's point of view. Now, one of my friends offered me this wonderful story. She wrote, my dad, at the age of 10, was evacuated from the east end of Sunderland to a pretty village in North Yorkshire. He was never the most handsome of specimens. Skinny, with large sticky out ears, very craggy, no money, plimsolls full of holes and a little feral in appearance. Consequently, he was left until last to be chosen. A late arriving farmer collected his unfortunate prize and yanked him into the tractor. He had four glorious years there. He became one of the family, spent his day running free, got a reasonable education. He hunted, fished and was fattened up. When he eventually and reluctantly arrived back at Hendon, his mum did not recognise his fit, strong teenager. And he went on to set up his own engineering business in Newcastle. Now, that's the story of the evacuees who went out. What we have in Clitheroe is the receiving family's stories. Three days before war was declared on the 3rd of September, Granny writes, the order came through for all the school children in the big towns to be evacuated to safer areas. 3,000 had been sent to Clitheroe. Three days later, she reports that the town is full of children. But soon after, they all go back home again, because this was Operation Pied Piper. Most of the children went home for Christmas and they stayed home. After all, the king and queen brought Elizabeth and Margaret home for Christmas. But once the bombing became intense with the Blitzkrieg, the children from Manchester were once again evacuated to Clitheroe. In 1940, Granny is offered an evacuee. 800 evacuees have come to the town and they brought us a mother and child. Well, I said we couldn't do with them. We'd have the child, though. 
So we went to St James School to get one. But there are only mothers with four or six children each who would not be separated. So no evacuee for her this time. The next year, 1941, she reports on the 27th of March that she'd been given a seven-year-old girl from Manchester called Florence. She has just had a bath and gone to bed. Now, my mum told me that she was filthy and flea-ridden, and so they burnt all her clothes and gave her a good bath. Granny confirms this a week later. Florence quietly told us they had a lot of bugs and beetles in her house. Poor little lass. There are ten children at their house and she hasn't had a chance. Her father had promised to come and see her a week after her arrival, but he never did. That wasn't the only problem. Only seven days after her arrival, Florence went out to play with Eric, another evacuee, at night. And they pinched a three-wheel cycle from somewhere. Well, it started raining, so I'll have to take it back tomorrow. And 11 days after her arrival, I took Florence to the doctors for bedwetting. Two days after that, the doctor suggested she'd be sent to a hostel for bedwetters. Oh, but she wasn't. Two weeks in, and Florence has an affectionate name and is freshly kitted out. Flory has got her new clothes. A month after her arrival, Flory bought me two bunches of daffodils home that a woman had given her. Seven weeks in, Flory says she's not going back home after the war, but she's going to stay here until the next war comes. Oh, but then she takes ill. I took Florence to the doctors and she's got whooping cough. The next day, took Florence to Waddo Hospital, which would have been the Girl Guide Centre at Waddo Hall, as the doctors ordered her there. She wasn't sent back until the 9th of June, which was two weeks later. But Florence's wish to stay in Clitheroe wasn't going to happen. On the 22nd of June, her father and brother came to see her. And on the 9th of July, they came back to take her home for a holiday. And she never came back to Clitheroe. She took with her the new clothes Granny had just purchased for her. Shoes, seven shillings and 11 pence. Socks, one shilling. And knickers, one shillings and tuppence. Mum told me how upset Granny was to lose this little girl. Well, she was fortunate. Well, both of them were fortunate. Two days before Florence left, Granny reports in her diary, Mrs Smith's evacuee nearly got drowned and the marshal's boy fell over Saltwell Quarry and got killed. And in May 1941, she writes, the Jacksons got shut of their evacuee. Shocking. Food rationing sounds horrible, doesn't it? But actually, it was fairer than the present situation whereby some of us can afford to eat well and many others cannot. And it's not just in recent times that we have been dependent on food coming from abroad. In 1939, less than a third of the food available in Britain was produced at home. In the opening wars, years of the war, the U-boat campaign sank many supply ships, bringing the food to us. And they created huge areas of mined sea channels, which meant that vital supplies of sugar, fruit, cereals and meat were drastically reduced. So rationing was introduced to make sure that people got an equal amount of food every week. They wanted the poorest to eat as well as the more affluent. And they didn't want food hoarding as had happened in the First World War. So everybody got a ration book. They had to register and buy their food from their chosen food shops. 
and the shopkeepers would cross off their ration books when they sold them the food. Sometimes there were problems with the coupons. She writes in 1945, I lost me toffee coupons and Wilfs for this month and the next. But of course, not everyone is equal. Granny and her family ate well. On Valentine's Day, 1939, before the war started, she writes, I have just made pork chops, Brussels sprouts and sliced potatoes for tea. Tomorrow, a beefsteak pudding. And on Thursday, an oxtail with barley and lentils. The following Sunday, I made a nice dinner. Roast pork, apple sauce, carrots, Brussels, potatoes and a Yorkshire pudding. And then she comments, I was rather tired after dinner. Breakfast in bed was a squeezed orange, poached egg, three slices of bread and butter and coffee. Not a lot changed until the beginning of 1940 when rationing was introduced. But in September, the government's food committee published a control order to fix some food prices. She states that new laid eggs would cost two shillings and sixpence, which I reckon is about eight pounds in today's money. So Christmas 1939 was celebrated with lots of food. Granny bought a 17 pound turkey for one pound, 11 shillings and eight pence. And there were bonuses. She states in October 1939, the local authority offices are selling seven and a half pound tins of biscuits off at three shillings and one penny per tin. As they got them for the refugees, but the powers that be said that the order for them had been transferred to Crawford's and Jacobs would not take them back. So they're selling them at cost price and I bought three tins. So I, I guess they didn't want the contract with Jacobs to continue as most of their biscuits were produced in Ireland. And so they couldn't guarantee a regular supply would be shipped over. Crawford's cream crackers were made in Liverpool. Uh, so why not eat the ones that arrived earlier? Uh, this appears to be bureaucracy, but it's very worst. Rationing starts with bacon, butter and sugar in January 1940. But Granny is undaunted. In April, I went up to get an extra ration paper for sugar to make jam. As you can only have sugar if you grow your own fruit, which she does. And anyway, my mum had just got a job at the ration office. So maybe they did get extra. There's no more mention of food deprivation until December when she reports on a shortage of onions. I went to mother's and took her an onion and two onions to my auntie. You can't buy onions anywhere. They came from Spain. Worse was to come in mid-December 1940. I cannot get any chocolate anywhere. It was grimmer in 1941, March. Cheese is very hard to get and no meat at the butchers for the first time, only corned beef. No eggs on the market in May, no tomatoes in June. Strawberries were available in July, but they were expensive. Strangely enough, she manages to buy four lemons and some oranges. Christmas 1941 was much more difficult. I went for a goose, but I couldn't get one anywhere. Turkeys are four pounds and two shillings. So that puts them off the map. So I got some pork and beef and a hen. And then soon after that, rice, peas and cereals are rationed and then soap. Even as late as 1951, she notes in her diary that she's bought dry soap in case it goes back on rations. And don't we think the same as, as the same with toilet roll? 
but she gets to work. In August 1940, they move into a new house with a huge garden next to the fields. And they start planting vegetables, lots of them. Leeks, onions, potatoes, tomatoes, salad vegetables and soft fruit. Not only in the back garden, but also in the front garden and in the road, which is unadopted where they grow potatoes. We have grown more vegetables to eat than we know what to do with. So they sell them on. She takes 53 pounds of leeks to the local greengrocer to sell on for her in March 1942. She sells the rest of the fruit and vegetables to friends and acquaintances. And she makes a note in her diary of what she charged every single one of them. In 1942, she sells 487 pounds of onions. She gets some nice returns, mind, including new laid eggs and meat from local farmers and under the counter specials from the butchers. For Christmas 1943, they feast on a sirloin of beef, half a shoulder of lamb, five pounds of pork and a cock chicken. We won't starve. Things seem to be taking a turn for the better in 1943 when my mum joins the service. Although Granny cannot buy any meat or fish in May, in September, my mum comes back from Compton Bassett with a box of chocolates. I don't think we've seen one for three years. And I think there might have been a bit of hoarding because in October 1944, I opened my last tin of lobster and a tin of peaches. It was in February 1944 that she went to her niece's wedding reception. There were 20 of us at the reception at the co-op rooms. Oh, we had a poor lunch. Soup, potatoes, carrots, brussels and tough meat. A slice of pudding and custard, four shillings a head. It was robbery. But for Christmas 1944, they finally get a nine pound goose for two pounds, 12 shillings and sixpence. Clothes and shoes were also rationed from the 1st of June 1941. Each person was allocated 66 coupons a year. Granny notes that her husband bought a new suit in November 1941 and another one two years later. The first one cost six pounds and 15 shillings plus 26 coupons just less than half of his annual allocation. Cosmetics were not rationed as women were encouraged to look their best, to wear makeup in order to boost morale. But the price of cosmetics increased throughout the war years and they were hard to come by. After all, the materials they were made from were being used for the war effort. Some businesses actually supplied women with their own lipstick tubes so they could put their own concoction in it. And I can remember my mother mixing up her lipsticks together. And posters were issued, beauty is your duty. Make, do and mend was what they did. And of course, this sentiment lasted long after the war. Do you remember darning socks? In addition, my grandmother was a good seamstress. She made her husband's shirts. In the July 1940 budget, clothing prices were to increase by 12% and cosmetics by 24%. In the April 1942 budget, the price of cosmetics, materials and hats all increased by a third. Even hairdressing prices increased. In August 1941, Amy had a hair pound for 10 shillings and sixpence as prices for perms will be increasing to 15 shillings the week afterwards. Although she seems to be able to source clothes for sale with coupons in the first few years of the war, 
by the end, she's struggling. In May 1943, I went to Blackburn and had a look for a coat. The prices are sky high and the quality of clothes too shoddy to wear. January 1944, went frog hunting, but not a bit of luck did I have. February 1944, mother and I went up to Blackburn looking for a frock, but no luck at all. Granny loved going out to live or filmed entertainment. It was she who taught me my repertoire of musical songs. So who can remember this? Your baby has gone down the black hole. Oh, Your baby has gone down the block. It's not rock and roll, but I like it. The poor little thing was so skinny and thin. It ought to have been bought in a jug, a bloody jug. Your baby is perfectly happy on his mother. He don't need no fun. In 1939, no before the war began, she is on holiday in Blackpool and she visits a circus. At night, we went to the Tower Circus. It was grand. We saw jaguars, black panthers and tigers. All gave an acrobatic turn. Dogs came on in crinolines and fancy dress and they danced. The trapeze act was wonderful. On a tightrope, there were two men on bikes and a chair in the middle with a man stood on it and with a lady stood on his shoulders. I had a go at riding on a mule. But my mum and a friend went to see George Formby instead. They've only been 16. Blackpool Tower Circus stayed open throughout the war as part of the aquatic shows. In 1940, there was a patriotic spectacle of Battle of the River Plate, where models of boats were used to recreate battle scenes leaving the audiences in awe, lifting their spirits. But Granny didn't go on holiday again until after the war. But my mum and her friend went to Blackpool in 1942 when they were 19. They came back with an Air Force badge on. She doesn't say whether she disapproves of this. But once the war started, they mainly went out to the cinema. Now, there were three cinemas in Clitheroe. The main one, the Grand, was just a few doors down from where they had the shop. Mum would recall how she would go there in her carpet slippers and she'd be given a cat to put on her lap. They went a lot to the cinema, sometimes twice a day, as there was a lot of choice both within Clitheroe and in the nearby towns such as Blackburn. It even went on Christmas Day. 1939 was a golden year for Hollywood films, with releases such as The Philadelphia Story, Fantasia and Rebecca. In December 1939, she notes they've been to see Let Freedom Ring, which was a Western. In February 1940, she sees The Confessions of a Nazi Spy, which was an American spy film thriller and included German actors who'd fled their homeland after the rise of Adolf Hitler. Also in 1940, Goodbye Mr. Chips. That won a Best Picture distinction in Hollywood. Gone with the Wind. And How Green Is My Valley? Now, there aren't any more mentions of film scene until 1944. Broadway Rhythm was a musical. She writes, It was very good with nice dresses, singing and dancing, and the best acrobats, including walking on their hands with their feet thrown up in the air and then round their necks and patting their cheeks with the soles of their feet. And all the time, walking round on their hands. I was intrigued to her giving an extra very good score to the oddly named Fanny by Gaslight. Now the plot's a bit convoluted. Fanny, played by Phyllis Calvert, 
finishes at boarding school in 1880 and returns to London, where she witnesses Lord Manderstoke, James Mason, fight and kill her supposed father. But she soon learns that her family has run a brothel next door to her home. And on her mother's death, he wasn't even a real father. She goes to meet her real father, a respected politician, and falls in love with Harry Summerford, Stuart Granger, his advisor. But she didn't enjoy a Canterbury tale, which she judged to be the worst picture we've ever seen. It highlighted the wartime experiences of the citizens of Kent, and it was probably too realistic for her. Not the usual wartime escapism on film. But there was still live entertainment. She goes to a pageant in the castle grounds in May 1943. The storming of the castle by the troops. Bandits came down and abducted 20 fair maids and put them in a hole under the castle wall. Oh, the screams were heartrending. Then the Royal Engineers came and they fought the bandits and the guns and fired. The Royal Artillery had 15 pounders firing from the castle field. The noise was terrific. Then the Duke of Low Moor came and rescued the fair maidens and made the bandits dig their own graves. There was a Royal Engineers training camp at nearby Low Moor, which was my, why my father came to Glitheroe and met my mum. And of course, there were church concerts. The Messiah was a Christmas treat. It even featured Kathleen Ferrier one year. She writes in December 1944, the church was packed to overflowing. They had a drum and a trumpet helping with the music. The singing was grand. Granny was a Methodist. She was a Wesleyan Methodist and worshipped at the Wesleyan Church in Clitheroe, now known as the Trinity Church. As was common at that time, the Protestants distrusted the Catholics. Let me just put this phone, throw it into the other room. You can't deal with all eventualities. As was common at that time, the Protestants distrusted the Catholics. After all, she remembered the orange marches in Blackburn at the beginning of the 20th century. Blackburn Orange Hall had opened in 1890 and closed in 1915. And the building is now the Blackburn Masonic Hall. And they did parade on Orange Day on the 12th of July. She remembered the hatred and the violence of the marches and their aftermath. In 1944, my mother wrote to her, Amy could not see any harm at all in anybody turning Catholic. So I sent her four good pages explaining the reasons why not to turn Catholic. I can only assume that mum and the wife had met people from all denominations and they were okay. In her later diary, she often describes the sermons on a Sunday. But there's not a lot about them in the war diaries. Maybe it's because the minister at the time, the Reverend Totty, was not inspirational. And she suspected him of being a pacifist. In October 1942, he preaches that we should love our enemies. Well, that doesn't go down well. Sometimes she's more interested in what else happens at the chapel. Mr. Totty preached on the best things in life are freely given to us if we will only accept them. We took a collection of 98 pounds. Another sermon that didn't go down well was on the sons of Korah. Korah had rebelled during the Exodus and was killed, but his children were spared. 
One branch of his descendants became temple guardians, while another branch served as temple singers and musicians. And these descendants of Korah contributed 12 works to the Book of Psalms, most of which may have been used in temple liturgy. But on the 13th of May, 1945, she writes, we watched the victory parade and went to church to a Thanksgiving service. Reverend Totty excelled himself. He preached a most inspiring sermon. There were other preachers, local preachers, a bit like lay readers in the Anglican church. On the 19th of October, 1941, Mr. Spencer preaches with a voice like thunder, but his sermon was extra good. Three days later, she goes to a talk by a minister's wife, Mrs. Kay from Accrington, who gives a good address on, has the wind a father. And there were special sermons. As would be expected in the Methodist church, they took Temperance Sunday very seriously with a sermon on drink and gambling being the curse of our times. And in October 1943, there's a special service for the Boys and Girls Comforts Fund for the Armed Forces. The Reverend Totty preached and asked us all to pray for them, spiritually, morally and physically. But the sermons the whole family looked forward to with great anticipation were the ones from Romany. In February 1943, Romani spoke on prayer and faith and said we had a wonderful gift to be able to pray and release forces that would act on those who we prayed for wherever they were. Romani was a Reverend George Bramwell Evans, a radio broadcaster and a writer on countryside and natural history and a minister for the Methodist Church. Maybe some of you have heard about him or can remember his newspaper articles and radio broadcasts. His mother was born in a gypsy wagon. His father was Salvation Army Lieutenant George Evans, a native of Plymouth. He was born in Hull in 1884 and he married Eunice, the daughter of the Reverend Owen Thomas on the 1st of August, 1911. He's most famous for his Out With Romany radio series, which commenced in 1933 on the BBC Children's Hour, describing travels in his own gypsy caravan with Comma the horse, his English cocker spaniel Rack, and his young friends Muriel and Doris. Actually, the programmes were all pre-scripted and performed entirely in the studio but he gave the impression of going out for a walk in the countryside and spontaneously discussing the plants and animals they came across. And he served as a Methodist minister in Goul, Carlisle, Huddersfield and Halifax. But in 1939, ill health forced him to give up the ministry and he retired him to Wilmslow. He died in November 1943. I guess the chapel was very full for his visits. Now, my parents were married at the Wesleyan Chapel in 1947 for this picture as of Granny's garden. Margaret Ann Parkington died in 1968 at the age of 72. She was a much loved granny with a magical garden that held the ghosts of intense cultivation but by the 1960s, it was well overgrown. After she died, the plot of land was split. The house was sold and a bungalow was built in the grounds. And they've both got good sized gardens. My cousin still lives in the bungalow. So I hope you've enjoyed this description of life in a quiet market town. It's good to know that there are areas of Britain that were not bombed, and where food was available, and in this case, all their young people came back safely. Thank you.
thank you very much indeed, Margaret. That was fantastic. Um, just so much to take in and su such so personal stories that are um, almost universal. Thank you so much for that. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments? Um, has anybody ha um, had access to similar diaries from relatives? Margaret, that was you... wonderful, Margaret. You bring that life uh, back to life so so well. Fantastic. Thank you, Lourdes. Margaret, <laughs> yeah. Do you have any information what happened to Stuart who went off with the, the new wife? Oh, yes, they came back to Clitheroe. Um, he said he wanted to have Cousin Ian, who Rosal have told you about. But um, Hilda, Ian's mother, wouldn't have anything to do with that. He went off to Canada. I he went, did he go through three wives, Rose? I think he did, yes. Yeah. Yeah, oh, blimey. Wives. <laughs> and only in the last year or two, as Ian got in touch with his half-sister. And we did that oh, right. through Facebook. Hmm? Uh, she said, Granny, she did well. <laughs> Isabel like said she really enjoyed that. Oh, yeah. thank you. And so did Matthew. We, we all watched it on a big TV here. We all so, really enjoyed it. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. And me, because she was my granny too. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Margaret, have you typed up the diaries or do you read from the actual... No, no, I'm not very good at um, transcripting things. I've got them all. I'm not sure. I mean, I, with the granddad's diaries of the First World War and with these diaries, yeah, I've kept them all and maybe Charlotte or Ma Isabel or Matthew might want to type them up later. I know that my, my granny had a spaniel um, at one point that she named Rack, obviously after Roman is spaniel, so she obviously was Ooh. a big fan. And didn't Eric Robson's dog call Rack as well? I think so, yes. It must have been a popular name for them. Yeah. But does anybody else remember Romany? Well, Romany was the grandfather of Ben Watt, who is in Everything But The Girl. Uh, I know that he's written a book about his uh, parents as well, so... Is, uh, I mean, I don't remember him. He was obviously before our time, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember him. Um, I was evacuated for four years from Hull. And um, I can remember, well, I thought I could remember. They must have recorded somehow the, the Romanist story because I can remember listening to those after the war. No. Yes, I, I can remember them, Doreen. It's I must have yeah, read the books, maybe, or had the books read to me. Yes, yes. It used to be on Children's Hour. And where, where were you brought up, Doreen? I come from Hull originally. Yeah, I mean, and we're Lancashire. I haven't found anybody yeah. in the North East who knows about him. Well, I live in the North East now. I moved up to Pontyland two years ago. <laughs> so I'm away from home, <laughs> away from my roots. <laughs> so, but we had a fantastic uh, terrible thing to say really but we had fantastic building when we went we went to a little village called Harpham which is between uh, Bridlington and Driffield and there were staunch Methodists we just lived in this big farmhouse and there was my mother my brother and myself and then my grandma and granddad were in Hull still and they got bombed and Mrs. Thompson just said, well, not, not bring them up, but, you know, write them a letter and tell them to come because we've got room in the farmhouse. So I had my grandma and granddad with us as well, you know. Oh, wow. my, fa my father was in the Merchant Navy, so that was the biggest worry, I think, of, the, of everything, you know, but he came back safely. So, uh, Yes, very happy times, to be quite honest. <laughs> it was a shock to come back to Bond Hall. <laughs> so, Margaret. I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. Margaret. Sarah. You know, this, um, this, the shop, did it carry on as a decorating shop throughout the war then? Or did they oh, change yeah. the type of things oh, yes, that they it sold? Oh, yes, it to the 60s or 70s when Uncle Wilf um, retired. I, I you just didn't imagine that people would be um, using that sort of sort of stuff in during the war. You just thought that maybe a shop like that would have been uh, not seen as essential. <laughs> you still wanted decorating and painting. Or black paints, particularly. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> I 
Well, I was surprised actually when um, I married my husband and found out his father was in a reserved occupation. And they actually went on holiday during the war. Well, I thought nobody went on holiday during the war. <laughs> so, <No>. wrong there. <laughs> Did you go on holiday? Is it who on, who's on the screen now? Doreen. Um, Doreen, did you go on holiday? No. I, I was saying about it. I didn't go on. I didn't go on holiday. I think no. most of us were born after after the war. My mother told me that she went on holiday. They went to Rill. And where was that from, Jane? That would be from uh, Wolverhampton area. Right. And uh, but she said all the um, you couldn't get down on the beach because it was all. Uh, barbed wire and mines and that. Yes, well, I'm all I'm 84 at Christmas. Um, Doreen speaking, I'm 84 at Christmas. So I can remember lots of things before we were actually evacuated. <laughs> so uh, I can remember going to the shelter and things like that. My, my, um, my grandma. Must have been about ages with yours, yeah. Marge. And uh, she told very similar stories. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. From living in a little village in the Midlands. Well, maybe we should bring the evening to your close. Margaret, I'd like to thank you on behalf of Lytton Phil and on behalf of everyone here tonight for such an evocative and interesting talk. It's really appreciated. Thank, thank you very you. much. And um, to the audience, thank you for joining us. Um, most, yeah! of our, most of our Zoom events are free and um, we do ask for donations. And I'm sure many of you have already donated to Lit and Phil. Um, if you haven't and you would like to do so, then you can do that on our website or you can do it um, when you look at our YouTube channel. So um, thank you again, Margaret. And I shall say goodnight to everybody, um, wherever you are, and hope to see you in the library very soon. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you